Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here again together, God. Uh, we're so excited, Father, to be able to worship you today, Father God, and to honor you. And Lord, we really want to be a church that is truly clay in your hands, that, Father, you're the potter. You want to mold us into what you desire us to be. And God, I pray that you speak through the sermon. If there's anything I've prepared, God, that's not from you, Lord, I pray that you'll silence my lips. Uh, Father God, if there's anything I didn't prepare that needs to be said, I pray that you speak through me, Father God. Use me as your vessel uh, this morning, Father. I pray that everyone walks out of here more like your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his mighty holy name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. You know, if you grab the bulletin, of course, you've got all the goals that we believe as we pray as a leadership team that God is going to do in 2021. We recently had the privilege of going with the leadership team to Mount Bethel, Pennsylvania and getting away from civilization and amen. just spending time with God and in fellowship. Amen. amen. And uh, these goals, as we collaborated together, I believe are really inspired by the Lord. And number one, we just said, you know something, what do we want God to do in 2021? And, you know, originally we did 120 last year and the church grew from 53 to 120, which is amazing, over double. Uh, but that number was because that was a number in the Bible. In fact, the church started in Acts chapter 1 with 120 souls. And that was the foundation for a movement that shook the very foundations of the Roman Empire and the world was evangelized in their day, amen? And I thought, what's the next number that God really wants us to hit as a church? I thought 3,000, you know, because in Acts chapter 2, you know, you got 3,000 the next day. But you know, that was a historical event that God prophesied about, amen, that just happened there. So I go, amen, well, well... Maybe we need to start first with something that will really call us to have to move a mountain. And originally we talked about 200. That was kind of the, the number we put out there. But you know, I told the leadership team, I go, you know something? I'm in sin. I, I allowed people to convince me to do 200. But in my heart, there is a story in the Bible that we're going to study today with this incredible number called 300. And the title of our sermon this morning is Mounting Moving Faith for 300. Amen? Amen. We're going to study out Gideon and his mighty 300. But before we do, we want to start with the Lord Jesus. Amen? Lord Jesus. And I think you're going to find as we study this morning that God loves to use those who will rely on him and are often forced into situations where they have to rely on him. And I don't know about you, but how many of you guys got things in your life that you just want to see changed. Amen? We're going to read in a moment. Those are our mountains, right? There's certain character flaws. There's certain sins, maybe besetting sins in our lives or certain insecurities or character things that we go, I really want to see God move this from my life. And I want you to imagine for a moment if God totally removed it after this service, what type of life would you live? Come on, bro. Come on. You would be unstoppable for our Lord. And yet God promises this. You ready to read it? Yeah. Come on, bro. This is going to blow your mind here. Come on, bro. We're going to read in Mark chapter 11 and verse 20. It says, In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look! The fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. Amen. Jesus starts off, and it's interesting. Peter comes and goes, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But then Jesus goes, have faith in God. Now, the original language in the Greek is kind of interesting because the word ends not there. It's the idea of, it should be translated literally, have the faith of God. Just as Jesus the day before spoke the fig tree out of existence, he says, You've got to have the faith of God to say to those mountains to move out of your life. Are you with me right here? 
That's the faith of God. What's the faith of God? God spoke the entire world into existence Amen. with his word. And this isn't some type of positive confession, just say good things and good things are going to happen. No, Jesus understands that what comes out of your mouth, what you say, reflects your heart. For the Bible says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. Yeah. And so Jesus says, if you would have the faith of God, you can say to this mountain to move. You know, mountains are symbolic from our first principles class. You'll learn this this Wednesday. What's a mountain symbolic of? Amen. A kingdom. You know, the idea here is that Jesus came to start a spiritual kingdom, which would be revealed in the scriptures as his church. And he's saying, you know, you've got to move the mountain of God's kingdom. Are you with me right here? We've got to forcefully advance his kingdom forward. Now, let's get a little context to try to understand this and back up a little bit so we can figure out more what Jesus is talking about. Look in chapter 11 and verse 12. Come on, Mike. Come, on. Come. Come the day before. It says, the next day as... They were leaving Bethany. Jesus was hungry. Amen. Maybe you, you're like Jesus right now. Amen. Amen. You go, yes, I'm hungry. I'm waiting for you to stop preaching. So I go, eat. <laughs> Wait a minute. Jesus was hungry too. So you can be like Christ there. Amen. Verse 13. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. You know, this passage is meaningful. And it's not a random case of Jesus just tree killing, okay? <laughs> There's a purpose to this when we understand it a little deeper. Fig trees, um, the way they grow, while it's not the season of figs, fig trees will produce these little buds that are edible, showing that the figs are going to come. And very interestingly, fig trees different than other trees their leaves will come first showing that the fruit is going to come and so what's happening here is jesus sees this fig tree and leaf and seemingly he's deceived by the appearance because it should have fruit but when he inspects it it's fruitless and so it's cursed wow. and the idea is that you can have the leaves and you can look the parts but on close inspection do you have the fruit in your life Right now, even more historically for them, it was even more significant because Israel oftentimes in Jeremiah chapter eight, verse 13 is one example is compared to a fig tree or a vine or some type of plant that is to produce. And so Jesus is saying, I came and I went to my sheep first, the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And, and yet there wasn't repentance. They didn't accept me as their Messiah. And so the fruit of the kingdom is not going to be born. And so they will be cursed. But as Matthew 21 says that his kingdom will be given to another people that will bear its fruit. And those are the people that follow Jesus by faith. Are you with me right here? And so what's Jesus looking for? He's looking for fruit. What is fruit? Of course, we're reminded of John chapter 15, where Jesus says, remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Amen. Amen. John chapter 15, verse eight. You'll memorize this in your first principles class. He says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, that passage, what's it talking about? We know it's not talking about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. For Galatians 5, uh, Paul would come some many years later after Jesus and write that the Holy Spirit produces his fruit in us. Amen. Peace, joy, love, patience. Those are the qualities we should all have as Christians. Amen. Amen. And yet in John 15, he's telling the disciples, you are to go and bear fruit, meaning that they are to reproduce themselves. So guys, what's an apple tree produce? Apple. What's an orange tree produce? Orange. What's a disciple produce? Apple. Disciples. That's why John 15 verse 16, he says, I've appointed you to go and bear fruit similar to the Great Commission. And all Jews would have understood this because what was the first command given to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. Talking about having physical children, though now Jesus is the spiritual vine. And he started a kingdom, his church, and God wants to see his church multiply and bear much fruit. Are you with me right here, guys? Amen. You know, I believe with all my heart that what God did last year was because we decided to remain in Jesus. Yeah. And the challenge is, is that we must continue to be a church that follows Jesus Christ. 
and does not compromise to what cultural Christianity tells us religion is supposed to be like, but follows the word of God. And you know, I shared with the staff, I got a little concerned because after we hit 120, do you guys know how long we went without a baptism in the church? It was over a month. And I just go, what's going on? What's going on? I thought about a passage in Revelation chapter 3, if you'll turn there. Revelation chapter 3. Of course, the fig tree was cursed, and later, in AD 70, the temple would be destroyed by the Romans, and animal sacrifice would be done away with, and truly Jesus' words came true. And his church started and evangelized the Roman Empire. Well, here in Revelation chapter 3, we read about this church in verse 1. He says, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive but you are dead. He says, you've got the leaves, but I didn't find any buds, or I didn't find any figs, I didn't find any fruits. I gotta ask you this morning, how are you really doing spiritually? Who are you when no one else is around? That shows who you really are. Are you truly still living as a disciple, or do you have hidden sin in your life that you've not confessed and dealt with this morning? Come on. What's the solution? Verse 2. He says, wake up! Amen. Maybe that some of us this morning needed that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard and obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief in the night and you will not know at what time it will come to you. And has not this past year taught us that? You never know when your last day is. And he says the solution to wake up spiritually is to repent and do what you originally heard. Amen. That's why I love the first principles class, because we go over the fundamentals of the faith of what's it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. Well, Jesus said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Amen. So we know that a true disciple of Jesus shares their faith with their family, with their friends. They are involved in Bible studies, making disciples. Amen. We know that the Bible says in Luke 9, 23, that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily. Daily. That being a disciple is a 24-7 walk, right? You've got to crucify your sin. You've got to deal with the temptation. You've got to confess it to your brothers and sisters so that you can continue to walk in the light. We know in Luke 14, he says, unless you give up everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. That a disciple is totally surrendered, willing to go anywhere, do anything, and drop everything for God. Amen? Amen. And then he says, you got to count the cost. And we all did that before we got baptized. That's what we said we were going to do. Yeah. You see, maybe you got to wake up and go back to the original decision that you made. You know, if you go back to Mark chapter 11. Come on, Come on Mike. Go, Mike. Come on, bro. Come on. In Mark chapter 11. I want to challenge every member in the church to be involved in a Bible study with a non-Christian this week. Maybe you don't have a friend that's studying the Bible right now or someone that you're working with. I will encourage you, talk to your sector leader, talk to your Bible talk leader, go, who's studying the Bible that I can get involved with right now? Now we kind of understand what happened here with this fig tree. And let's read this again. Look back in Mark chapter 11 and verse 20. It says, in the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, or the faith of God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says this mountain, go, throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it, and it will be yours. This is so funny. Peter then the next day sees the fig tree, and he's shocked that what Jesus said actually happens. He goes, oh my gosh, the fig tree, it, it's withered. You know, sometimes we're like that with our prayers. We actually pray something, and then we're shocked that it's answered. Yeah. And you know, if we, I can just catch you be real for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can get all excited and be like, yeah, 120 and 2020, and we'd be talking about this three months from now, and everyone's kind of like, okay, guys, that's great. 
But the reality is, when we study discipleship, if one disciple in a year just makes another disciple, doesn't the church double? Like, is that really mountain-moving faith, what God did last year? Can I just be honest? Like, isn't that just what God expects? Yeah. And lots of times you have people come on stage and go, oh, brother so-and-so was so fruitful and so awesome and so godly. And the reality is, is that they're just fulfilling their Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Go, amen. Thanks for being a Christian. Yeah. Bro, I prayed for an hour a day. Woohoo! I'm glad that you talked to the most important relationship in your life for one hour today. Come on, buddy. That's where we get. We have a reputation of being alive. And, you know, they're going to, you know, they do the stories on GNN. And we go, oh, man, that's so cool. Look at Boston. And the reality is that we get caught up in the praise. And we don't stay close to Jesus. And the church goes by a month not baptizing anybody. And God's trying to go, wake up. You're not going to stand before God. Oh, I was part of the International Christian Church, the movement of God. And God's like, where's the fruits? God doesn't judge churches, he judges individuals. And we'll all stand before the Lord and give an account. Now he does judge them in a collective sense, in the sense of his discipline, his guidance, like we're talking about right now. But when you stand before the Lord, it's going to be you and God. And he's going to look for fruit, amen? And then he says, hey, listen, here's, here's the thing. The fig tree was cursed. Yes, Peter, what I said came true. But you know, that's a little discouraging, amen? He goes, I want to inspire you guys. You can move mountains in your life if you would just believe and not doubt. He says, I want to give you a secret to prayer. When you pray, don't say, dear God, I pray that this year my mom becomes a Christian. He says, when you pray, say, thank you, God, that in 2021, my mom became a Christian. Come on. Dear God, I pray I find a girlfriend this year and a boyfriend, or I pray that I get married this year. No, you go, dear God, thank you that in 2021, I found the love of my life. Dear God, I pray we hit 300. It's going to be so hard. No. Dear God, thank you so much that the church blew past 300. Amen. Yeah. We've got some mountains to hit as a church. You know, this year we're going to plant Providence, Rhode Island. Amen. Yeah. And we're going to need a team of around 15 people to go. And maybe you're wondering who's going to plant that church. Yeah. Well, I believe that's the mountain movers themselves. Calder and Dr. Cassandra yeah. Kim. And you know, it's really encouraging to see all the, the mountains that have been moved in the South Sector, is it not? Yeah. And I believe God's made it very clear. But you know, for you, I want to get into our first point. Move the personal mountains. Come on, Mike. We're talking about a better version of yourself is needed. Move the personal mountains. That was my introduction, amen? amen. Hope you're ready to rock and roll. Let's go to Judges chapter 6 here. Come on. Judges chapter 6. Preach it, bro. Judges chapter 6, we're going to find Gideon. And I don't know if you remember uh, the story of Gideon. And so let me, I'm going to summarize a lot. I do encourage you to go back. We are a Bible church. And read what I say in the scriptures. If anything I say doesn't come from the scriptures, you can forget it. But if it comes from the scriptures, this is not some skinny guy yelling at you. This is really God's spirit. Are you with me right here? In Judges chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. This is a bad time for God's people. There's no leadership. In fact, the very last verse in the book of Judges says Israel had no king, so everyone did as they saw fit. God's enemies had invaded and come in, and every time they planted crops and they're about to reap the harvest, their enemies would come in and grab it for them. Thanks for doing the work. And they'd go grab all the food and steal it from them. You ever felt like that in life? I can never get ahead. 
Anytime I plant something, I get out of debt a little bit, but then the debt comes back the next month. I study the Bible with my friend. We get all the way through studying the cross of Christ to get to the church. And then they bail and decide not to get baptized. And as the parable of the sower says, the birds that represent Satan come in and snatch away the seed that was sown. You ever just felt like you can never get ahead? You need some mountain moving faith. Now we're going to be introduced here to Gideon who is participating in these people. Now, remember, the people cried out to God. And the Bible says in verse 7, when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You know, any time that we cry out to God, God sends people into our lives. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's so encouraging seeing um, the different souls that I met with here just a moment ago who are deciding to get baptized into Christ today. Amen. And it was very encouraging because these are people that were seeking God, and God sent disciples into their lives. Look at verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abrazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. The Lord answered, I'll be with you and we'll strike down all the Midianites together. Okay, so we meet Gideon and he's threshing wheat under a wine press. He is insecure, fearful, scared, and God meets him and he simply says these words in verse 12. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Amen. Now I've got to ask, did Gideon look like a mighty warrior at this point? like a mighty coward huh <laughs> and maybe you've been there before and yet God sees us for who we truly are in our spirits he sees you as a mighty warrior for God a mighty warrior for God amen sisters God sees you for the potential that you have and the fact that you're here this morning means God has specifically called you to do something great. Now, God is calling Gideon to save all of Israel out of the enemy's hands. And of course, God has called us to save the world from the flames. Are you with me right here, guys? And it's really crazy because God meets him in a very insecure and personal place. Gideon says to him, God, you don't understand. If you've been with us, why has all this horrible stuff happened? Wow. You know, you can look at the last year and question God's intent. And we've seen people do that, have we not? Yeah. Why COVID-19? Why the racial tensions and the political divides that we see in our country? Yeah. And then let alone all the stuff going on in the world, just your own life. People you know sick, maybe physical challenges, mental health challenges that you have. And maybe you're like Gideon, but I want to put before you, you have to grab the way God sees you if you're going to move mountains in your life. Yeah. That it starts there. Now, he hasn't done anything great yet, right? Yeah. But it starts by receiving the word of God. Now, Gideon didn't really believe in me too much at the beginning. He goes, why has all this stuff happened? He goes, you don't understand, God. I'm the weakest in my family. You don't get how I've grown up. You don't get my family situation. I'm in Manasseh, the weakest tribe. And our family does not have a good history. You know, to move mountains, you've got to first move your personal mountains. And you're going to find that God is very patient with Gideon. It's kind of interesting. Gideon goes, okay, God, if you're really serious about this, I'm going to make an animal sacrifice. You've got to, you know, have the fire come down, consume it, all this kind of stuff, right? And so God goes in verse 18, the Bible says, 
Please, Gideon says to him, please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'll wait until you return. Don't you love that? God's just patient. He goes, I'll, I'll wait for you. I'm willing to meet you where you're at and work with you. We can all praise God for that. Amen. Verse 25, if you drop down, of course, God proves himself faithful. Sacrifice happens. And, and verse 25 says, that same night, the Lord said to him, take a second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of his height using wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down to offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of his town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the men of the town got up, they were at Bell's altar. They saw Bell's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The men in the town demanded to dress, bring out your son. He must die because he's broken down Bell's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Before Gideon can do something great and save all of Israel, God goes, you need to go back to your family and deal with some idols that have been built there. Whoa. Idols are things we worship other than God. Now, we tend to think of idols like back then, where we worship statues. But in Ephesians 5, the Bible calls impurity an idol, greed an idol. It's just any relationship, thing, person we put before the Lord. Are you with me right here, guys? He goes, you've got to go back and deal with these idols. Now, Gideon, I love this. He does it at night, amen? <laughs> Because he's a little afraid, but God kind of lets it slide. Amen? Maybe some of you teens can relate. Some of you guys got baptized, and you just kind of like made it happen. Are you with me right there? Okay, you know, my parents are really against this, but I want to follow the Lord. Amen? <laughs> Going to do it at night. And, and God goes, okay. But he goes, you know something? There's consequences. Because when they wake up in the morning, they see the idols destroyed, they want to kill him. You go, who did this? Who got rid of what? We worshiped. And what was it? Baal. Now, Baal was a fertility god. Baal's the, you know, the descendants of Baal, eventually is Pan in the Roman times, but is where we get the drawing of our devil from with the two horns and the pitchfork and all that. He's a fertility god, and so they would have sex orgies um, around this god to try to incite God to bring rain on the land. Now, we read that and we think, oh, they stopped worshiping God. Well, in their minds, they still worshiped Jehovah God, our God, but they also worshiped Baal at the same time. Wow. Thus, he was the most high God, and you had Baal over here, and then you had an Asherah pole. An Asherah pole was a male organ. That, that's what they worshiped. That's how perverted and far from God they got. God goes, you've got to get rid of this perverted stuff wow. if I'm going to use you. Yeah. And he goes, you got to go back to your family. you got to let them know you are for God. Yeah. And you have to take a stand with your family. Too many of us allow our families to influence us. And we forget Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 27, where Jesus says, unless you put me first, you cannot be my disciple. Yeah. And we forget. You know, for you, does your family, are you bold with them that this is my calling? I'm a disciple of Jesus, and nothing can shake me or pull me away from Christ. Come on, See, I think the idols we have to destroy for a lot of us is just that, the, that family connection that pulls away you away from Jesus. Are you with me right here? Amen. Now, God calls us to love our families. I believe when you're a Christian, you actually love them deeper because you understand you want to bring the gospel to them. Are you with me right here, guys? And so my, my relationship with my parents has gotten better since I've become a Christian. Amen. But initially, it was a little different. It was strange for my dad to understand why was I going to church all the time. I was a teenager when I was baptized. I was 13 years old when I made the decision for Christ. And now I'm hanging out with all these brothers. I'm going to midweek on Wednesday night. This was before COVID. I wasn't logging on something. Like, I was, like, actually driving, going to church, wow. going to Sunday morning service. And it was hard. But I had to make it clear to my father that this is my passion. It's God's. Or else I would be ever, forever held back. Have you made it clear that Jesus is your everything? Have you taken a stand? Keep your finger there. Go to Mark chapter 3. Invictus, bro. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
In Mark chapter 3, you know, God is all about family. And I love the church because the church is called a family. And look at this in Mark chapter 3. We find in verse 13, Jesus had thousands following him, but Jesus understood if he wanted to influence the masses, he needed a small group to train. Amen? Amen. And so in verse 13, it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, to have authority to drive out demons. They are the 12. These are the 12 he appointed. So this is kind of cool, guys. Uh, these 12, they're called the what? The apostles. So he selects 12 men for one purpose. He says, number one, to be with me, meaning they need to learn. They need to walk with me. They, they need to be with me doing ministry so they can grow and learn. This is discipleship. Amen, guys? Amen. Then the goal is that once they learned and imitated Jesus, he could send them out to start their own small groups. Amen? Start their own ministries. That's discipleship. And he goes, I'm going to call you guys the 12 because in the Old Testament... There were 12 tribes of Israel. He goes, you guys are going to be 12 because you're going to start the church, spiritual Israel. And the apostles, that's a cool name. In the Greek, it just means the messengers. So he gave his little, little Bible talk in our language, a cool name, amen? You know, this is what we base our Bible talks off of in the church. We believe if we're going to follow Jesus, everyone's got to be a member of a small group. Because as the church grows, is it, is it, can you know every single person in the church when it's thousands? Like, no. Even now, it's hard. Many of you probably like, I've never met this person before. I didn't know they were a disciple. <laughs> and yet we need that family unit, that small group, to be like Jesus. On, and so in our Bible talks, every, the Bible talk leader uh, is a stretch from Jesus. Amen. And the members are a stretch from the apostles. Amen, guys. And we're emulating that model to be able to build the church. I've got to ask you, how committed are you to your Bible talk family? Or are you just a Sunday Christian that comes to church on Sunday, but you skip a Bible talk? You see, we're building a family, and there's going to be small groups all throughout New England, so there's a beacon of light that anyone can reach. Amen? This is why we have discipleship in the church. You know, Jesus commanded after you're baptized that you're a mentor. If someone stays with you and continues to teach you to obey the Bible. We see these relationships all through the Word of God. Moses discipled Joshua. Paul discipled Timothy. Peter discipled John Mark. You've got all these relationships. And so we encourage every member to get with their discipling partner once a week and have a time of Bible study, confession, prayer, and strengthening. Amen? Amen. And this is what Jesus did. Now drop down here. Go to verse 20. After he calls the apostles, in verse 20, it says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind! So what did Jesus' own family think about him, guys? Crazy. Crazy! He's brainwashed! In our terminology today, oh, he's part of a cult! Now you're going to find, significantly, Jesus's mom, Mary, is present there. Remember, Mary had the miraculous birth. We all know the Christmas story. But at this point, Jesus now had started preaching his message, and she goes, oh my gosh, this is a little intense. We grew up here in this community, Jesus, and what are you doing to our family name? Look at verse 22, how the religious people reacted. It says, and the teacher of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Guys, you know who we get the most persecution from as a church? It's not atheists. It's other churches. Other religious people that don't hold to the standard of God's word. And you have to get comfortable knowing that Christianity is not all fuzzy, warm, rainbows all the time. But there's conflict, right? And Jesus' own family persecuted him. Now check this out. It's about to get even more heated here. Drop down to verse 31. Come on, Mike. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. And a crowd was sitting around him. They told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. The church says, wow. The family comes to take Jesus away. And Jesus is there with his Bible talk, amen. Yeah. His small group. And one of the disciples comes in and goes, your family's here. 
And Jesus goes, well, who is my family? Is it not those who do God's will? Yeah. Now, he took this stand. How do you think that made Mary feel? Probably hurt. The Bible doesn't say. But I imagine she'd probably be hurt. And yet, he never compromised for If Jesus would have compromised, mm -hmm. she would have not seen an example of what it truly means to follow God. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And because he took that stand, after the resurrection, guess who all became disciples? Yeah. Mary and the brothers. In fact, Jude and James wrote books in the Bible. Is that pretty awesome, guys? Yeah. See, if you want hope for your family, don't compromise. Don't go, okay, I'll miss church. Just hang out with you guys. You go, no, I'm committed to God. I'm committed to his kingdom. Come on. Come on. You got to move the personal mountains. And it may be scary. It may be frightening. It's okay to be fearful. It's not okay to give in to fear. Okay. That's the difference. Come on. Let's go back to Judges. Chapter 7. God had to work, and I'm not going to, for time, I'm going to give you kind of a little bit of a summary, but God had to work. Um, you go, oh man, he's ready to go now, right? No. He goes, well, God, if this is really you, I'm going to put out a fleece in the morning, and if there's dew on it, that means you want me to go and do this mission that you already told me I could do anyway. <laughs> of course, it happens. He goes, okay, you know, God, don't be angry with me, but I'm going to do it one more time, but this time make the fleece dry and... and so God performs the miracle and goes, okay, and God's just so patient working with him, amen? You see, God wants to build his faith. The fleece wasn't to see if this was God's will or not. The fleece was to strengthen his faith. Some of you are studying the Bible and you're wondering, should I get baptized? Well, yes, you should. <laughs> the Bible commands you to, amen? amen. <laughs> but we pray for stupid things. Amen. Like, could you imagine if I prayed, God, should I cheat on my wife or not? I just want to seek your will. Well, no, you idiot. That's against the word of God. But guys, that's what we do when we pray about whether we should become Christians or not. When God already commanded it. Now, you can put out some fleece and go, God, strengthen my faith because I'm weak and I need your help. I need courage. But don't reject God's words. Now, Gideon has thousands of men with him at this point. Mm -hmm. And he should have been a little bit more confident. His enemies had 185,000. Look at this, Judges chapter 7. This is fun. Yeah. Verse 1. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that's Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Marah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. Could you imagine this situation? You're sitting there, you're like, all right, my faith's finally built. I'm ready to go, God. God goes, no, 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 you got way too many. Um, God makes, you know, make an announcement. Anyone that's scared, you can leave. And the Bible says 22,000 men left. Imagine getting just sitting there, like, watching everyone leave. <laughs> Like, oh my gosh. God goes, I don't want you to boast about your own strength. Which is interesting because originally when God called him, when he was at his weakest moment, he goes, go in the strength that you have. Like we read in Revelation, strengthen what remains. You see, it starts there. You just got to get your butt to church. You just got to say, I'm not going to do this even though I don't feel like it. But then what happens? God goes, okay, I built your faith. And now my power is going to get involved. Wow. And he trims back all those who are fearful. You know, um, bottom line, you can't be a coward and be a Christian. Mm. Wow. And these guys, I'm sure, do you think Gideon felt fear at this moment? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Fear is okay. We all feel that. And yet it's giving into it. That's a sin. I've been so inspired by uh, our brother Junior. Amen. <laughs> I go on Facebook the other day, and, and I see Junior is door knocking. Come on, bro. Like going to doors, like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, you know? But except he's a, he's a true Christian for the kingdom, amen? amen. He's going to, to doors. I want to share my faith that you're talking about Jesus. Come on, Come on, Come on, bro. I was called higher. I was like, oh my gosh, I would be terrified to do that. <laughs> Are you going to be willing to push yourself? I want to ask you, what would you do 
if you had no fear today? Wow. Absolutely no fear. What would you do? Well, that's what you need to do. That's what God's called you to do. Well, let's see if it gets, gets better. Come on, Mike. Look here in verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I'll sift them for you there. If I say to this one, he shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say to this one, he shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that lapped, I'll save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Amen. Well, God now strips them down even more. He goes, all right, let's do this. Go get a drink of water. And the ones that lap their hands like dogs, he goes, those are the ones I, I, you know, I want to work with. Now, there's a little bit of debate in the original language, whether it's the ones who lap like dogs or the ones who kneeled. And so you can study that out on your own. But scholars are in agreement. The idea was that God wanted those who were battle ready. It's those who kneeled down at the right sight, line of sight, so they could see who was going to come and attack them. I think we learned a huge lesson here. God wants the Christians that are battle ready. Are you with me right here, guys? Prepared to fight in the spiritual war. Keep your finger there. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, we're going to look in verse 11. I want you to stand up if you were baptized last year. Wow. Look around, guys. Look around. You know, I really want to commend all of you who took a stand for your faith. You guys are to be honored because during a very challenging year, you decided God is going to be my king. Now you go ahead and sit down. What's inspiring about this is that we have now all these young brothers and sisters that we're working with to get battle ready. Amen. Now, I want you to imagine if all of them are personally fruitful this year. Look at, this. Look at what the Bible expects from us in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. He says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though, by this time you ought to be what, guys? Teachers. Teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word. In the King James Bible, it says the first principles of Christianity. That's where we get that term first principles from. That just means the elementary teachings. All over again, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, not being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of the hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. You know, God says here, I want all of you to become teachers. So this isn't talking about like the role of the pastor, that everyone's going to be a, you know, a minister and that sort. But it's the idea that everyone in the church, look around at all of you guys, say, say to your neighbor right now, you're going to become a teacher. Yeah, maybe you didn't know that as a, as a new Christian. Now, what are you going to teach? You're going to teach, the Bible says, true maturity is the ability to teach the fundamentals of the faith, the first principles. And so maybe you've kind of blown off your first principles class and done bad on the quizzes or not showed up because you knew you weren't ready or whatever. The time for that is done. I want to call you to go, I'm going to be battle ready and learn the fundamentals of faith so I can teach my friends and obey God's word, amen. And imagine if we have 126 or whatever it is going to be battle ready Christians with the sword of the spirit, God's word, ready to go. That's God's plan. See, we've got to mature. In fact, he says part of maturity in verse 14 is distinguishing good from evil. Some of us need to grow in our discernment yeah. of what's good and what's evil. We play games with things like flirting around with non-Christians in the world and thinking about dating outside the church when God says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. 
we play around with sin and, and we don't put ourselves in situations that are compromising and we're not serious about our faith and the Bible says you can't mature that way. See, if you're not growing, you're dying. Look at any plant. If it's not growing, it's dying. If my daughter Bellamy stops growing, there's something wrong. We're going to the hospital. Are you with me right there? Understand it's time to go to solid food church. But that doesn't mean you need to know all the Greek and Hebrew and all this stuff. That's great if you do, amen? I saw Justin had a Hebrew-Greek Bible there. I was like, that's awesome, amen? He's, he's digging deep. But, but maturity starts with learning to teach the fundamentals of the faith. Yeah. You see, you're all called to be a leader. Yeah. Say why? Because Jesus was a what? Yeah. Leader. And we're all called to be like Jesus, amen? You know, secondly, we need to move the impossible mountains together. The impossible mountains. God-sized victories are going to have God-sized battles. Sometimes we go, oh, I really want this. I want to be fruitful in my family. Or I really want to lead in God's kingdom. Or I want to go on a mission team. Well, do you realize you're signing up for some God-sized battles? He's going to have to get you ready for that. And it might mean stripping you down so you have nothing to rely on like Gideon did. And you can't boast that it was your own strength because God wants the glory. But it's going to take a focused determination. You know, uh, there was a man named Sir Edmund Hillary. Yeah. And at first he, he failed in climbing Mount Everest. Eventually he was successful. Yeah. And Sir Edmund Hillary was the first person to climb Mount Everest, which is the tallest mountain in the world. And I thought this story would be relevant as we talk about moving mountains. Amen. He failed on his initial effort. But he had made a valiant effort, and Parliament wanted to recognize him for it. They felt that he deserved the recognition. They put a picture of Mount Everest on the wall in their chambers, and they invited him in. And they stood as one, a standing ovation, for the good effort that Sir Edmund Hillary had made. As he walked to the front of the room to address Parliament, tears welled up in his eyes. They were not tears of happiness. They were not tears of joy. They were tears of anger and frustration. He had not set out to make a good effort to climb that mountain. He had not set out to leave five of his associates dead on the side of that mountain. He had set out to climb Mount Everest. He was at a crossroads in his life and he knew that if he accepted the accolades for making a good effort, that he would never climb that mountain. As he walked to the front of the room, he looked at the picture. He looked at those legislators standing and applauding him for him. He recognized something that many of us never recognize, and that was this. Yes, he made a good effort, but the greatest enemy of excellence is good. He would not be satisfied with that good effort. He would only be satisfied by climbing that mountain. He walked to the front of the room. He looked again at the picture of Mount Everest. He looked at the people standing there applauding. He literally walked over to that picture and he pounded on that inanimate object. And he hollered at it and he screamed at it and he said, you defeated me once, but you'll never defeat me again because you've grown all that you can grow, but I'm still growing. We are still growing, church. And we'll grow to 300, but I believe we're going to grow spiritually. I'm excited to see all the new sector leaders that are going to come out of this group. What well, we need servants. I'm excited to see our children's ministry revamped today. Is that awesome to see our children's ministry? But I want to encourage everyone to have a heart to go, I'm willing to sign up and serve the children in our church. And you know, not today, but next Sunday, we're going to be having a leaders meeting where we go over all of our kids' kingdom protocol. And we're going to really revamp um, all the, the precautions that we take, all the protocol. But if you are interested in serving the children, I would ask that you come to this leaders meeting because I think it will be very relevant for you. Amen. And it's a big need in our church. We've been meeting because of COVID the whole last year, not having a children's ministry. And so we've got to revamp this as we kind of get into some sense of normalcy later this year. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you though, are you just making a good effort in your Christianity? Wow. That's the enemy of excellence. Are you just trying? Trying is lying. Jesus says, make every effort to enter the narrow road. Are you with me right here, guys? To move the impossible mountains like getting to 300, we need to strive to be excellent. 
Gideon had God, and that's all he needed. Do you realize God is all you need to overcome anything in your life? And that God is with you every day at your lowest moments and at your most victorious moments. I need us to move the impossible mountains we have before us as a church, like growing to 300. But we also got some financial mountains that we need to move. Amen. Amen. Of course, if you look on your bulletin, you'll find one of the goals for our special missions contribution. Number seven is to raise over $120,000 for our missions contribution. Now, if you just look at the list, these are all the churches we're planting. It's got Bahrain, you've got the Congo on there, Sri Lanka, uh, Scotland, um, I mean, all these different places. Not to mention Providence, and then of course next Sunday will be the Philadelphia's inaugural service, amen? We're planting all these churches, and it takes an incredible amount of money. Now, encouragingly, last year, guys, we raised over $117,000 for missions contributions. Isn't that awesome, church? And so our goal this year is a mountain moving $120,000 for our missions contribution. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, if you're new to the church, now once a year what we do is we have a time where we fundraise money to go to missions. And this is not part of our weekly contribution, which we committed to meet our local needs as a church, to pay for where we meet and support the staff. And of course, we understand we're giving first to God. Amen? Amen. But this is money that we raise separately to support all of our foreign mission work and domestic church plantings here in the U.S. And of course, 2 Corinthians 8 is very special because this was a special collection taken by Paul to help support the church in Jerusalem. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty, welled up with rich generosity. For I testify that they were able to get, they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the who? Lord. The Lord, amen. And then to us, in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. He says, excellence, amen. Guys, I want to encourage us to excel in our Christianity. We need to be excellent at our jobs. You should be the employee of the month all the time. Because you're a Christian. I want to encourage you, do you excel in your timeliness and your integrity and when you arrive to events? I want to encourage us to be excellent in our faith and in our speech as a church, so that we can be a light to the city. Anyone should be able to walk into our church. The president should be able to come into our church and go, this is excellence. Your professor, your boss, should come into the church and go, this is excellent. But you know, he goes, excel in the grace of giving. Giving so special. He goes, this poor church and these churches in Macedonia, they were extremely poor. Something we do not understand here in America. And I encourage you guys, when the missions conferences start again, come with Chanel and I to India and go see poverty firsthand and see these churches that we support financially. Mm -hmm. You'll be moved. So crazier to me when people struggle with, oh, it's special missions time. Oh my goodness, you would never say that right there being in the situation. You'd be moved. We're so blessed. So I want every member to start praying about what can God do? What can I give for missions? And and we'll give kind of each ministry a a certain goal, and we'll we'll talk about that more soon. But I want you to be praying that we can raise this money to continue to support our brothers and sisters around the world. And the Bible says they gave beyond their ability. So can you give beyond your ability? Absolutely. It's a faith issue, right? It's a faith issue. You know, what do you need to change right now to be a better student, to be a better husband, a better wife, a better employee, a better disciple of Jesus. You know, as we close out, I simply want to end with the point, moving forward as a team to take the mountain. Moving forward as a team. Look back in Judges chapter 7. And we'll close out here. Look in Judges chapter 7. It's been fun being together again, amen? 
was excited. It felt like the first time I was preaching ever again, you know? It's been, been a while. And Judges chapter 7 and verse 15. So they got their 300. They're ready to go. And let's see what happens here. Judges chapter 7 and verse 15. Before we read that, uh, I want to explain a little bit of what, what's happened. So essentially, they go spy out the Midianite army's camp, and they're, they're encamped, God's enemies, in this valley. So imagine these mountains kind of around this valley, and they're all encamped there. And so some of the soldiers, they go, and they kind of spy out on them. And one of the Midianites has this dream. And he tells one of the other soldiers, he goes, yeah, I had this dream, and there was this big barley loaf of bread. And this big piece of bread came and crushed all the Midianite armies in the valley. You go, what's that all about? Well, he wakes up, the other soldier goes, wow, that's surely the, the sword of Gideon coming and defeating us. You go, how did, how did they come to that conclusion? Well, interestingly, barley loaf bread was for those that are poor. It represented poverty, right? Because you didn't have the yeast there that kind of kept it together. So what God was saying is that this weak, poor people is going to crush this powerful army. And of course, the barley loaves foreshadow, of course, Jesus who fed the 5,000 and Jesus who's the bread of life. Amen? Amen? And so the idea, guys, is that Jesus is going to use us in our brokenness, in our poverty, amen, amen. to crush all the enemies of God and take New England for Christ. Amen. But it's going to take a team effort. Check this out. Verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed the trumpets and the empty jars in the hands of all of them, with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew the trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled from beth towards Zeria, as far as the border of Abel and Mahal near Taba. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and Almanasa were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. And you read on, guys, they get the victory. Is that pretty awesome? Yeah. But, but what happens? How? Gideon goes, guys, watch me and follow my lead. We call that in the New Testament imitation, amen? You see, God chose a leader. God always chooses a leader, and the people will only rise to the faith of that leader. Amen, guys? You know, I still remember when Chanel and I were called to go plant the church in Gainesville, Florida. It was really exciting because one of the brothers presented to me this sword that if you've been to my office, you've probably seen it in my room. And it's, on it was engraved a sword for the Lord and a sword for Mike. And it was such a special treasure. And there's a picture, you know, of, of me holding the sword with the mission team. And what was awesome about that mission team, that first year, that church grew over 300%. Yeah. It's one of the fastest growing in the movement of that year. And I believe it's because everyone dedicated themselves to follow God and the God-like qualities of their leader. And sometimes we get weird about that. But understand, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, follow me as I follow Christ. And we're talk, talking about following someone's personality or the way they dress or their haircut. Or you know what I mean? That's weird, right? We're talking about following the Christ-like things in them. It's time, guys, to go, I'm going to really follow my Bible talk leader and get behind their plans and be unified. I'm going to get behind my sector leader. Are you with me right here? And be unified. You see, I've got to ask you, are you part of the team? You know, sometimes we go, oh man, Mike, your faith is so crazy for 300 for the Lord. I dream of a day where they go, all the Boston disciples' faith is crazy. Wow. It's a shared dream, amen? Yeah. Leadership brings unity. You know, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 8, Paul receives the Macedonian vision. 
And it's of this man crying out to Paul, and he goes, Come, help us. Paul wakes up from the vision and goes, I know where God's calling us to go. And you know what the Bible says? The men got ready at once and went with him. See, some people grab the dream, and then others got to share that dream. Are you with me right here, guys? We understand leadership brings unity. Every family has a leader. Who's the family biblically? In the, in, in, or who's the leader in the family biblically? The husband, right? Understand, we see that in the business world. Every company has a CEO. You always need a quarterback. You always need a coach. You always need someone to call the shots. It's so sad. There are churches in our nation where they're led by some board and they take six months to decide what color the carpet's going to be in the sanctuary. Dead in churches that will never do anything for God. And yet God says, no, you need leadership. Amen? Amen. I want everyone to pray about if God's called them to have this vision. You see, God has given the vision of planting Providence, Rhode Island. Why? Because we need to get to Brown University. Amen? Amen. And we need, we, need, we need more leaders and future world changers that are going to come out of some of these Ivy League colleges. And I want you to pray about if God has put on your heart to go to Providence, Rhode Island, and to uproot your life and move there with Calder and Cass for the sake of helping to build God's church. Amen? Amen. Some disciples don't have the concept down that we're a team. And I always know it because they, th they say things like this. Why does the church do this? Yeah. Or why do you guys do this? Or why do yeah. they do this? Well, you are they. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Mike. You are the church. But anytime someone speaks the language of distancing themselves, be sure they are not part of the family. They've distanced themselves. And what we need is for everyone to be family, to be a part of the team. This is the only way we'll evangelize the world. You see, I really believe with all my heart that leadership, leadership is going to make the difference. The book, Bible is a book of leaders. You know, recently we had our covenant renewal and we put out to the church based on Nehemiah 10, where Nehemiah and his leaders put out a document and they said, you are to affix your seals to this document, renewing their convictions to God to get rid of all the sin they've been involved in. Are you with me right here, guys? And you can go back and listen to that if you want a more biblical basis for that. But you know, at the beginning of the year, we put out a covenant renewal where we have everyone in the church review the convictions that we all said when we said Jesus is Lord at baptism. Amen. amen. And, and, and we sign it and we update our pledge if God's allowed us to. Some of we won't be able to do that. We give sacrificially already. And we commit ourselves to being a member of a church. And it's so sad because we live in a time where people lack commitment. It's true. We, we, we fear that people talk about, oh, I just want a church hop. No such thing in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves. Yeah. They were devoted. They were committed. You see, everyone wants to be committed to God, but will you be committed to the church? Right. See, what is the church? It's what? The body of who? Right. Right. See, to the level that you're committed to the church is to the level you're committed to Christ. Amen. Amen. Don't let Satan fake you out with all the false garbage that's out there. This is what the Bible teaches. And it was sad that we had uh, multiple. I'm not just talking to one person. So if you feel like I'm singling you out, amen, be convicted and repent. But, but, <laughs> but, but there was a co collective few that felt uncomfortable signing this, this document. And it was confusing me. I go, that's weird. They're willing to come to my house or go in a lake and get plunged in water by some random person they just met studying the Bible with them. And yet they didn't want to sign a document that just simply reaffirmed what they already said they believe. Yeah. I go, that, that's a scary person to, to want to get married to. Because when you get married, you sign a document. Can you imagine I marry my wife? Well, I don't really want to sign the legal documents. Think she'd be fired up about that? It's a lack of submission to godly leadership. And we got to get conviction. I'm just speaking real, guys. This, this is the one time we get the whole family together. And, and, and it's not time to feel down or sad. It's time to you know something. What's in my heart? Where am I? There's distrust or suspicion or, 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 or some type of thing in my heart. 
No, it was really cool. You saw in the video, every member of those 53 disciples signed that document or committed to it verbally. And they said, you know what? We're going to change the world. And we are all here now because of those 53's faith signing that document. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so I really want Paul to imitate those who have gone before us and go, we're going to sign the document. We're going to renew our convictions and really see God work. See, there was a strategy. Gideon goes, listen, we're going to take the 300. We're going to put 100 on one mountain, 100 on another mountain, 100 over here. They took over all the lamps, all the, the, the fire torches that the guys had left behind that, that left, all those cowards. You remember that? They took the fire torches. They took all the jars, and they waited in the middle of the night when the guard was being changed. And then Gideon goes, all right, let's do it. And they throw down the glasses, breaking them. So imagine if you're a Midianite sleeping in this valley. You wake up hearing all this glass kind of echo into this valley. And then you just look up, and you see all these lights coming towards you. You go, oh my gosh, what's going on? And they just panicked. And the Bible says they actually start slicing each other. And I just don't know what's going on. You see, God said, you're going to take these people. But he didn't just go, all right, go for it. They had a strategy, amen? amen. They had a plan. You know, we've got to have a good plan to get to 300 this year for the Lord. How are we going to do it? It's simply four people getting baptized a week. Isn't that awesome? That's it. You know, 300 is just six groups of 50. Right now, we have four sectors around 25 to 30 each. It's just simply every sector reduplicating itself. Wow. That's all it is. It's not really mountain. Mountain moving would be like 500 or something, right? But this is what God has put on our hearts. And so today, guys, I want to encourage you. Maybe you've been like, Sir Edmund Hillary, and you go, you know something? I, I, I got close, but I haven't really climbed the mountain. And I just made a good effort. I want to inspire you to say today, I'm going to take my mustard seed of faith that I'm going to get at the end of service. And allow that to be a memorial for you. That today was the day you decided that I'm going to move mountains for God. And together as a team, we'll take New England for God. And to God be the glory. Amen, guys.